Let's talk about my family's journey towards the keto diet. Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of Heiser Says. I thought I'd do something a bit different today. I'm going to share a personal story of myself and my family going to reaching the keto diet over the last few years. I'm doing this because it's the new year and often people make resolutions to improve their health, improve their well-being, you know, to lose some weight. And I've been there myself. And it can be quite difficult if you don't really understand how the human body works. So I thought I would share this with you and I'll take you through a series of lectures and videos that we've, you know, discovered along our journey. And the first one that I'll talk about is Sugar the Bitter Truth by Dr. Robert Lutzig. And this video was quite, quite interesting for us because my wife decided she wanted to go on a fast and give up sugar because she had a sugar problem. She loved her sugar. She had a sweet tooth. She would eat, you know, a block of chocolate, a family block of chocolate by herself in one sitting. And, you know, Rachel and I, we were working in our office and we'd, we'd drive home. And we'd even have the kids in the office back then. Well, we only had one. And we'd often drive past a Macca's and we'd drive in there and we'd go and get some McDonald's and we'll, sadly we were doing that several times a week. So our diet was convenient but it was not healthy at all. And this video was one of the best ones, really the best introduction that woke us up to the truth about sugar. And this, uh, you know, it's a long video. And I'll just be showing some stills through all of these, these references I'm talking to you because I want you to go and watch them yourself because the order that I've presented them in is the order that we've gone in this journey. And you'll see that one thing builds upon another. So Dr. Uh, Robert Lutzig, now he goes, upon, uh, goes into this video all about really sugar and the big issue, particularly in the States, is the high fructose corn syrup and how much people... Uh, process or how much people eat of this stuff and it's not because they're sitting there drinking the high fructose corn syrup it's because it's in all of the foods that we have because back when there was a whole you know the whole push that high saturated fat was unhealthy and there was this demand for low fat products what do you do you can either make it sweeter add salt or add fat if you take out the fat it tastes like rubbish so they add more sugar. And what's fructose corn syrup? It's just a cheaper version of it. And it has the same effect in the body. So a high fructose corn syrup is 40 to 55% fructose. And sucrose is 50% fructose. So here he shows the relative sweetness of the high fructose corn syrup compared to other types of uh, sweet products like inverted sugars or glucose or sucrose. You can see it's quite a sweet product. And this is also my first introduction to the seven countries study. Now, if you're not familiar with it, by going down this rabbit hole, you're going to become familiar with it. And this was published in the, eight, what, in the 70s. And it looked at a correlation between coronary heart disease and dietary fat. Okay, between different countries here and the correlation. Now, the problem is there was an intercorrelation of sucrose and saturated fat. So people were eating high levels of sugar in these first world countries because of the processed food that they were having or the natural diets they were having. Because look here, Italy here with the Mediterranean diet, higher levels of fat. And it was kind of ignored. It was kind of because it didn't really meet the outcome that they wanted to achieve. So I suggest you watch the video and look into it a bit more. And he also talks about the different, this is my first introduction to the different types of fat or different types of cholesterol that you have. Because we've had all of this, you know, when we read anything in the news, you only get a snippet and a slice of it. It's never in, in depth enough for you to make an actual, accurate decision. And you're just saying cholesterol is bad, cholesterol is bad. Well, no, cholesterol isn't bad. Cholesterol is needed in every single cell of your body. So he's talking here, you know, finishing, I'll finish off 
what the takeaway from his talk was that your body essentially processes the sugar in a similar way to processing alcohol. And it's, it goes into the liver. The only difference is the alcohol affects your brain, so you feel it. So you can actually pickle your liver by eating sugar and this processed food. So set some time aside and watch this lecture because it really will wake you up to the truth about sugar, some of the you know, fake or biased research that's gotten out there that has shaped a lot of what people believe today and has shaped the food pyramid today. Okay, and this guy isn't a hack. He isn't some, you know, Instagram, you know, weightlifter or some, you know, vegan fruit juice guy. He's a professional, well-respected professional and well-written professional. And it's a good lecture. He also has some, you know, condensed versions of the long, long haul lecture, but I recommend it. And the links will all be below. So after that, what did we do? We did the Daniel fast. Okay, what's the Daniel fast? Now, the Daniel fast is based on the biblical uh, tale of Daniel, who was you know, a Jew taken away from Israel, and um, he refused to eat the food in that nation. He didn't want to eat any of the meat that was sacrificed to their gods, as fun, essentially. So he just ended up having a vegetable broth, the polis, or not a polis, a veggie stew, pretty much. So we did this. It was hardcore veganism. And look at some of the stuff I had to give up. I gave up coffee. Coffee. I gave up bread. Well, no, I get, we had to give up yeast. So I ended up making just bread out of grains. We ended up buying our own grains. I would grind it myself to make this flatbread. And we ate a lot of vegetables. Now, we lost, what, 10 kilos in the time I did? And, it, you know, you didn't have any of the issues as the keto flu in adapting to this diet because we were just cutting out meat. But really, we were also cutting out a lot of processed stuff. No more McDonald's, no more packaged foods. We were trying to eat really clean. And I remember we had lots and lots of roast vegetables. We didn't have any butter on them. You know, it's just carbs. So unbeknownst to us, we were spiking the hell out of our insulin. Because you also have to realize, the more you learn about this, the more you, re the more you will understand that there's two models with regards to weight loss and, you know, and weight in your body, weight management. There's the calorie intake model. And that's based on people who burn foodstuffs you know, in a beaker and say, oh, that's how much energy it is in it, and assume they can translate that perfectly to a human metabolism. And saying, well, if you eat less calories, you'll be skinny. So if you don't, you know, if you're not doing that, it's all your fault. You're just a fat bastard. You know, boo. You know, and that, that really, it's quite a primitive way of understanding it, where the endocrine model is more to do with hormonal methods in your body. So when you eat carbohydrates, your insulin spikes. And when your insulin spikes, it, re it will resist burning of fat. It will use those carbohydrates in, in the form of glucose. And then it will start storing fat. Now, personally, I believe that's because in you know, ancient times, when humans were hunter-gathering, they were eating lots of meat. Whenever you'd stumbled across a fruit tree, you just wanted to eat as much, as much as you can so that you could store it in your body efficiently for future use as fat. So, you know, it, it's kind of all starting to make sense for me. So we did the Daniel fast. We lasted 20 days. And why did we stop? Because Rachel got sick. She got a cold. She was sick. So we had to stop. And that's when we started introducing meat and dairy back into our diet. But it's, it's interesting that, you know, she didn't have the resilience. It's not like we get sick very often. So... You know, that was good. We, we were eating cleaner, but our weight was still slowly creeping up. Every time Rachel would have a child, she'd, you know, put on a lot of weight. And I would put on weight too. Because I'd be, you know, I was tracking my calories and doing that. But then, you know, you get a bit lazy and, oh, well, I'll skip it a bit here. I'd go visit my mother and I'd eat, you know, lots of bread rolls. The one thing I miss on keto is the Woolworths or the Coles bread rolls with the sesame seeds on it. That's fantastic. That was my Achilles heel. So then we started learning about keto. And it was my father-in-law that really started digging into it because he discovered, he had, is, uh, suffered from you know, heart disease, had some heart attacks, bypass surgery, and insulin and oh, for diabetes. And you know, he was being told to just take more and more insulin and his sugar le insulin levels were going out of control and it was, he was just putting weight on him. He, he 
t- didn't want to die from this stuff because you hear the thing, diabetics just get fatter and fatter and fatter. So the solution is just to add more insulin. Now, the ketogenic diet traditionally was developed for two reasons. The first was to treat epilepsy and the reference to, to treating epilepsy and fasting and controlling your food. That's, the, that's even biblical. So that's ancient knowledge that we've lost. And the second is for diabetics. Before insulin was commercially available, before you know, it was discovered and used as a treatment, they would fast and they'd use a ketogenic diet. So where is, what's a good reference? If you're thinking, okay, I'm interested in this, Florian, what, where can I go? And our low carb down under is a fantastic source of information about ketogenic and just low carb, high fat diets. But the first video or lecture I suggest you watch is this one by Dr. Robert Lutzig. Now this is this one here, and it's called what is it? Learning about no, hang on. I'll just snick to the reference here. Dr. Stephen Pelly, Robert Lutzig. Okay, I don't have it here. It, well, essentially, it's I'll add it to the links below. You'll find it, um, and it's all about the history of ketosis because Robert Lutzig invent coined the term nutritional ketosis and this lecture it's you know only 45 minutes but it is fantastic for anyone who is interested in the, interested in this topic because he looks at you know traditional low carb civilizations the inuit are a perfect example and here is referencing the diary from Do- dr dr frederick schwatka who traveled 3000 miles across the canadian arctic with two inuit families Okay, so rather than dragging all his food with him, he ate like the Inuit did. And one thing that he interest, he says is that it took, uh, you know, so I'll read this quote. When first thrown upon the diet of reindeer meat, it seems inadequate to properly nourish the system. There is an apparent weakness and inability to perform severe exertion, fatiguing journeys. But this soon passes away in the course of two to three weeks. So you know what's happening there. His body is adapting to a keto state. So, his diary is published in 65. Uh, so, this is, but sadly, it wouldn't receive wide press, uh, wide exposure. So, other examples he goes to is the Maasai of East Africa. I didn't, hadn't heard of them. They're herders who live on meat, milk, and blood. That's it. And you look at them, you know, they're looking healthy. They're looking strong. They're looking tall. They're looking fit. So, compared to their, you know, subsistence farming neighbors, the Kiku, the Maasai were taller, six foot males, th- uh, by, oh, sorry, six inches for males and three inches for females, leaner and had less tooth decay. Less tooth decay. Now that's interesting. That's a very interesting. He also references here the um, 1928 Bellevue Stephen- Stephenson experiment because there was an a, um, anthropologist who went up and lived with the Inuit, came back. And they didn't believe him so that, that he could live off solely meats because that was just when vegetables were discovered as sources of vitamins and minerals. And he said, no, nah, screw you. They put him in an insane asylum. They monitored him, his food for a year. And he was fine, completely fine. And look at his diet. It was protein, 15 to 20%. Fat, over 80%. And carbs, just 2%. So it was a, a, a traditional keto diet. Now, the Inuit, they will even grind up the bones and they'll eat some of that. They will really use the animal tail to tail. So his lecture is a fantastic one as a reference or a starter to go down this journey. It'll give you a firm basis for it because there is historical precedent for living like this. It's not a fad. The standard American diet, the standard Australian diet, how old are they? 70 years now? How many civilizations? You know, Do you think the Maasai... Do you think they were just eating, you know, vegetables? No, they're not. Look at the the evolutionary benefit of them compared to their subsistence farming neighbors. What about the Inuit? Even our own indigenous cultures here in Australia, when they started eating the Western diet, they got all these health issues. So if you want to learn more about that, watch the movie The Magic Pill. And in the, in the beginning, it, has, uh, it talks about a program where they take indigenous Australians, Aboriginal community, take them, you know, volunteers for two weeks to live traditionally. And their diet is very similar 
to this. It's a very high fat diet. Like a witchy grub is a huge amount of fat. So here are the conclusions he gives. Low carbohydrate, high fat diets have existed since humans first learned to hunt. Okay? That, that I think, is demonstrable, demonstrable. You can't argue against that. If you try to, well, you're on the same page as a flat earther, in my opinion. There is a required four, a required four to six week adaption period after which well-being and, and athletic function are restored, if not enhanced. So he's done research into the athletic application of these diets. Despite increased total and saturated fat intakes, blood lipids improve, blood saturated fat levels decline, and inflammation is reduced on a well-formulated ketogenic diet. Scientific data suggests that, a, that we redefine ketones as highly desirable nutrients. Because you talk to any doctor and you tell them you're going on the keto diet, and they'll freak out, they'll worry. Because they have heard of ketoacidosis. That's when the ketones in your body are so high that you're at risk of death. That's what they're taught. They're not taught this. So this one I would recommend, definitely. And the Low Carb Down Under website, I'm referring to a few videos there. It is a fantastic reference. It's just amazing. So, you know, we're starting keto, we're going into it, and we're learning more and more. This is another reference here. This is actually the first one that I watched from Low Carb Down Under. It was Dr. Paul Mason, Low Carb from a Doctor's Perspective. Now, he treats people, diabetics and other people with health issues and, and severe weight with this diet. And just his insight as a professional practitioner was invaluable. And I'll link to this lecture as well. And I strongly recommend you watch it. Now... Some of the takeaways here are the difference in a low-carbohydrate and a low-fat diet with regards to weight loss, just showing you how much more effective the um, low-carbohydrate diet was compared to a low-fat diet was. Because we're all taught, we're all taught that fat's bad, fat's bad, fat's bad. You know, you put fat on if you eat too much fat. But it's not true. This is evidence. You can't disagree with it. And here he gives an example of just how much sugar is hidden in foods and that goes right back to the the first video uh, the first video i referenced about the bitter truth of sugar looking at you know tomato sauce 1.5 teaspoons per serve per serve you know 11 teaspoons per serve and you remember these things have more than one serve in them sometimes that's how they get the statistics down you're only meant to like drink a third of a cup or something so it's just insane how much of this sugar is hidden in your food when you go on a keto diet you don't go down the middle of the aisles anymore you just go around the edge of the aisles in your shopping center so okay now you know oh here's another video that he has and i'll link to this one which is very interesting about the effects of reducing dietary fiber because people will worry oh what happens if i reduce my fiber you know i may get constipated what's going on and you can these are all the symptoms of the dietary fiber of, of diarrhea and look at the rate that they had, you know, constipation, strained opening, bloating, anal bleeding and pain. And the ones with a serofiber diet, the carnival people had none of those. So this is an interesting video to watch just to challenge some of your preconceptions. I'm not recommending it because, well, you know, I've, I've improved my, um, let's say, passage since then. I'm not going much less, but it's some people respond differently. So, you know, we're a family of four, four children, and the wife and I, so we're actually a family of six. Is the diet safe for children? That's what people ask. And I'll link to a video here from Dr. Barry. And I, sorry, mate, I've got a very horrible clip of you here, but he has a video explaining the diet. Because traditionally, if you look back at, you know, the cultures that we have here, do you think the children ate different to the parents? Do you think the Inuit went and got a mango or a, a banana for their kids? No, they didn't. Do you think the Maasai feed the children differently? Maybe they do. I doubt it. Um, so, yeah. And also, if you think in these cultures, when the women are breastfeeding their children, when you have a higher fat diet, your breast milk actually is a higher fat. And I know this because I've seen it, because Rachel switched to a keto diet when she pumps the breast milk for storage, you can actually look at the bottle and you can compare it to when she wasn't on the keto diet. Now, the midwives freak out 
at mothers who go on a low-fat diet because often when you get pregnant, you put a lot of weight on and you want to lose it. And if you go on a low-fat diet, that can cause issues for the children. They don't get enough sustenance. They don't receive, they become malnourished. So uh, this is a good video link to this one. But this one here from uh, Tyran, uh, Tyran uh, Polovin is fantastic. She's, it's about feeding a family. And it's very practical day-to-day -day advice. You know, she talks, talks about cooking and prepping for her family. Her kids aren't in ketosis, neither are ours. But you want to keep them in a low carb state, if you can, and, and, and you don't want to be making separate meals for the children to you. That's a pain in the ass. No one wants to do that. So she's got here a whole example of food swaps, and I'll link to her video. If you've got kids, this is really useful for day to day. I treat it like, you know, today we had a play date, and the neighbour came over and brought you know bags of lollies and things, and I see that as our children, um, you know, if they were out in the wild, they'd find a fruit tree. Or they'll find a honey, you know, honey uh, beehive and we'll just crack it open and start eating it, eating it, eating it. So, you know, occasional bursts of, you know, carbohydrate and sugar for a child, you know, on rare times, I've got less issue with. For me, it's more of a problem. I'm older. My metabolism is, you know, not as young and virile as the kids. And for them, sometimes the grandparents need to experience a sugar rush. So that's kind of our approach, and our children are thriving. Our newest born, Odelia, who has been breastfed completely on, on a, from a ketogenic boob, we'll say, is huge. She's grown really big. She's growing, meeting all the targets, healthy as anything. You know, she's rolling over now in three months, turning around, responsive, no difference, thriving baby. So another one that we want to look at is the ancestral diet. Now, this is very interesting. This is one from Dr. Berry again, and I'll link to him. And, and if you're looking at this, this diet, I think you should subscribe to these channels because I'd highly recommend it. But the premise is that depending on your genetic heritage, you need to consider your, well, the diet that your people would traditionally have had. So an example would be if you have a northern European diet, it would have been a lot more meat, it would have been reindeer, it would have been fatty things, compared to a Mediterranean diet, you know, compared to an Asian diet. You need to look at the historical food that your ancestors ate and factor that into how you construct your diet. Now, because of this, Dr. Berry actually went carnivore because he's got so many people in northern Europe. Makes you think, what's Dr. Peterson's genetic heritage? What's yours? I'd like to do a test just to see what mine is would be interesting to see. So, you know, that's, that's another thing to consider. And that kind of ties into the next factor, which is about seed oil and vegetable oil. And Nina uh, Chickholtz, uh, her lecture, vegetable oils, the Un vegetable oils, the Untold Story, and she has a book on the topic, and I'll link to this video, is quite shocking, really. It's She's discussing the chemistry of fatty acids and the different types of fatty acids that you have. You've got the unsaturated um, fatty acids and you've got the saturated ones. The saturated ones, every carbon atom has a hydrogen atom attached to it. The unsaturated ones, you've got these ones here with a double bond. So you can break that bond and you can attach another molecule to it. Maybe a H2O molecule. Maybe something else. And if you're adding, increasing the number of molecules attached to a fatty acid, you're going to increase the size of, it, size of it, and that will result in inflammation and other health issues. And you have to remember, humans traditionally have eaten saturated fat from animals and monounsaturated fat, which is olive oil and those type of things. Polyunsaturated are not, or unsaturated, or yeah, these polyunsaturated are the same thing, are not uh, going to, are not traditional. I was, we were at Ikea yesterday, and I was trying to find out what type of oil they use in their cooking. And they use rapeseed oil. It is a vegetable oil, and they, they advertise it as using the traditional way. And best I could find, the traditional way of producing that oil was invented in 74. So it, it's misleading in some ways. But she discusses the process of hydrogenation of these oils. And it is just, it's a chemical process. These are engineered seed oils. 
you want to eat stuff where if you put it between two pieces of timber and you squeeze it, you can get oil out of. Are you going to get that from soybeans? Are you going to get that from rice? Are you going to get that from rapeseed? So you've got to look at it. And she also discusses the history of the American Heart Association, how it was founded, and the conflict of interest by the founding of that organization, how it affected their position. And just one thing I want to share with you here, a little, little sip, it, like a cell. Now, a typical cell in your body will have a cell membrane, and that's composed of lipids, and that comes from fat. So if you're consuming these artificial fats that can um, cause inflammation, and that's affecting your, shell, your cells, what can that do to your body? What about if you have these uh, polyunsaturated or unsaturated fats, cells or lipids used to construct these membranes? How is it going to affect things passing through into the cell? What if something bonds with one of the molecules? What's going to happen? You tell me. I don't know. We've got a range of non-communicable diseases which are becoming more and more prevalent. And it kind of aligns with the standard American diet. They recommend that you eat a portion of vegetable oil. You need to look into this. So this, this is also added to our um, diet where we're removing all vegetable oils. When I discovered this, I threw them all out. But the biggest challenge is when you eat out, finding a restaurant that doesn't cook in it because it's cheap. Okay? It is cheap. It's easier to store than tallow and lard and it's cheap. That's it. So you're going to have a nightmare finding it. So then we look at fasting. And this, I'm going to link to a lecture on it by what I learned. Now, he's got some fantastic videos. I really love them. But this is just a, a few clips from the fasting video where he talks about you know, the benefits of fasting. And he discusses Angus um, Barbria fasted for 382 days and went from 456 pounds down to 180 pounds. Now, don't do this without medical advice, or medical help. He was actually going to the hospital all the time, getting blood tests and everything. But that's what he looked like. I am actually in the middle of a seven-day fast. I'm starting the year with a fast. I've never fasted this long. Before, when I was on a you know, normal diet, I would try and fast and I would fail miserably. It would be really difficult to do. Really difficult. I'd get really hungry and grumpy and angry. And now, what's the day? What is it? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Day five. Is it? Yes, let me, let me check. It's Thursday, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Good. Good, good, good. One, two. Yeah, day five. So I've only got two days left. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's definitely something to incorporate into your diet. My wife has incorporated intermittent fasting into her diet where she'll restrict her eating window. Some people will only have one time they eat. If you think back you know, to ancestral uh, heritage or if you think back to, you know, traditional cultures, hunter-gatherer cultures. Do you think people ate every three hours? No, they wouldn't have. They would go days without it. There's actually the warrior's diet, which I haven't really looked into at all, what I've heard about where people, you know, restrict their eating windows and incorporate fasting into it. But be careful with fasting. I watched a, a video of a guy who fasted for 21 days, ate raw eggs and wound up in a hospital with appendicitis. And he thinks uh, drinking some juice will save him. He refused to go under the knife. Well, so how have we gone through this process? We've learned all this stuff. What are our results? So, well, we started by buying grass-fed, slow-grown, um, pasture-raised beef. We had to get it brought in from Melbourne up to here. We bought an entire beast. We went to our butchers and they organized it for us and they cut it up exactly how we wanted and so, you know, we've got it in the freezer now and we're eating a lot of it, a lot of red meat. Some of the things that you need to, to appreciate is that, you know, you want to keep much of the fat. We got all the bones and we boiled up the bones, or all the ones from the carcass in here, and we use that to create tallow. And the tallow is what we cook the beef in. It's really good to cook in. It's better than, because either you cook in vegetable, uh, not vegetable oil, butter, and you want grass-fed butter too, cook in uh, olive oil. But olive oil has a much lower smoke point, so it'll burn quicker. And tallow or lard. Tallow we made, and it has a much higher smoke point, so it's really good to cook with. But everything tastes like beef. If you, but I don't mind. I'm used to it. So 
you know, we bought that. We've really cleaned up our diet. We're, you know, adding cream and butter to everything. We, w- we did start by tracking our macros, tracking how much of a percentage of fat we were eating, how many carbs, uh, how many, uh, how much um, protein we were getting. Because it's not a high protein diet. If you go on keto, it's a high fat diet. You need to want to get like 60 to 80% fat, 20 to 15% protein, you know, 5% carbs. So many people go about it wrong just eating all this protein, not realizing they have to eat the fat. Once you get used to it, it tastes bloody good. It really does. So, you know, we did that. And let's have a look at some of our results. So this is my wife. This is Rachel here. And I'll draw this on here. Now, this was, what, first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester, roughly. Okay, for the first trimester, and we weren't on the keto diet there. We weren't on keto. She kind of held her weight just with our diet. Then second trimester, it shot up. Okay, she hit over 100 kilos. So she was... Um, obese, or I think, oh, yeah, obese there. And at this point, I was getting worried because I'd started doing a lot of this research about, you know, I'd learned about sugar and all these issues. And I said, honey, I don't, I want you to lose weight. I want you to get to a healthy level of weight before you have any more children because I'm scared that you're going to, you know, get diabetes. You're going to die. We have to ha- hack off a leg, something like that. For the, okay, so then she started doing, you know, she couldn't, learning a little bit about keto, but she couldn't do it because she was pregnant. So she started intermittent fasting. So she only ate during particular windows. I think she only had two meals a day. And, you know, the baby was huge. That didn't cause any problem with the baby. The baby was actually too big. We had to be induced. So you can see here, boom, she gave birth. And that's probably the best way a woman can lose weight is pumping out a baby. She gave birth. And then we started the keto diet. And you can see, you know, she had a bit of a uh, jump up and it was steadily progressing down. You know, where I think today she's now, she's gone to overweight and she's just tracking down and down. She's losing a few kilos every month and quite healthy for it. So it's good. It's working. And, you know, energy is fine. Um, one thing when you go into this diet during this period, you may get the keto flu. And that's when your body is adapting to using fat as energy source. And one thing to do is to make bone broth and drink the bone broth. Because you get a lot of um, nutrients or minerals and vitamins from the bone broth than you would otherwise. Because you're 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 kind of flipping your diet and your body's adjusting. Now, avoid the stock cubes because some of them contain vegetable oil. So that, that's a little trap to fall out for. Another thing, with regards to the animal here, we couldn't get any of the organs. The organ meat is fantastic for you to eat. It's, you know, the liver, the kidneys, heart, even the brain are good for you because they contain a lot of the vitamins and nutrients. You can get vitamin C from the lean meat and the muscle meat in, in a cow. You get more inside the other parts of the organs. You can't get it when you, unless you do a private kill. We've learned that. But one trick to consider is when you get mince made, get some organ meat put into the mince. Then you don't have to you know, eat liver. It's just all in the organs. We haven't done that yet. We'll do that next time. So this was Rachel's journey. She's continuing on the keto diet and she pretty much thinks it's just going to be a way of living. We've, we've reached the point now where we think this is the natural way for humans to eat. So here's my, my diet. You can see here... You know, if uh, kind of look here, I stop. You can see when I weigh myself when I took a break. And I kind of stopped and weighed here and I was up to, what, 87 or something? And I was freaking out. And what the hell's happened? You know, I got down to 80 and I jumped back up again. And that that's when I kind of put the pressure on Rachel going, yeah, we need to do something about this. And so then, you know, I started kind of intermittent fasting with Rachel. Not really, more just when she cooked, I'd eat that type of thing. And then I started the keto diet. And I was just, you know, getting lower and lower. And this is with with no exercise. Last time I'd lost weight, I was using uh, calorie counting and doing daily weights. But, you know, I kind of got slack with the weights. And just circumstances of life, it's been so insane, I haven't really got back to it. That's part of my my resolution this year is to get it back, pardon me, <clears throat> Get it back into my daily habit and we'll see how it goes. 
So you can see here, I kind of for a month, I hovered around what between 76 and 77, which is just for me, which is just on the line between overweight and ideal. So I decided I'm just going to fast for seven days. I've never done it before. I've gone, the most I went was three days. And just to see if I can break through that, uh, that barrier. Because with a, with a bloke, if you stall for a month, you want to look at what you're doing. Because also I've stopped tracking. I've stopped tracking my intake. I haven't measured it now. We've kind of got to the point where we know what we need to do and we're just adding more fat to things and doing that type of stuff with how we eat. And it's worked really well. So, you know, going on a seven day fast, that's probably a topic for another video. I wouldn't recommend it. You need, you know, you need to get professional advice, but it's worked out really well for me. I've got more energy. I'm not tired anymore in the afternoons. Often I'd need a, you know, a snack or some chocolate in the afternoons. If I work back late, I'd want to eat something. Now I'll snack on some cheese, maybe cut up a little piece of onion or something with it. Yeah, maybe, or I'll make some wristles, cook them up, just eat them. And it's been quite good for us. I'm, I'm definitely a fan of it. I think there's a historical basis for it. You know, I think it's, uh, from a human evolutionary perspective, it makes entire sense. You know, if, if you don't believe, you're not a fan of evolution from a creationist perspective, even if you look back at how humans ate traditionally, from biblical perspective or ancient times, much more meat. And even the size of the grains and the wheats that they would have eaten are different to ours. They would be heirloom grain, grains, different to what we have. So that is kind of my keto video, guys. Um, I'm going to stick with it. The wife is going to stick with it. Just going to, um, you know, kind of keep track, track of it, you know, keep eating, keep getting healthier. Once now that I'm, I'm in ideal, I'm going to start, uh, bringing back, you know, doing daily weights and those type of thing as well. But if you're interested and you want a new year's resolution, I really suggest you look at it. It'll help, you know, clean up your food, clean up your diet, clean up your lifestyle. So guys, Thank you all very much for joining me for this episode. Please like, share, and subscribe. Please let me know your comments. How have you gone? Oh, one thing I should add. My father-in-law is now off insulin. He can control it through his diet. That's quite common. When you start delving into this, you'll see many stories where people are doing that. And you've got to think, that's also a, um, a money-saving thing on your day-to-day -day life buying the medicine. Maybe not so much here in Australia with our benefit scheme, but in other countries, it definitely is. So guys, thank you for joining me for this episode. Please like, share, and subscribe. Let me know in the comments if you've done this diet, what your success stories are, if you um, plan to do it. Now, one thing I should finish off, if you have, if you're taking medicine or you have any medical conditions, you need to talk to your doctor because the danger is that if you go on a diet like this and you... Uh, you're still taking your medicine, the medicine is tailored towards the standard diet. And you could throw it out and you can cause yourself a lot of damage. Now, that's your doctor's problem to deal with. They should be able to, you should be able to go and tell them, give them this research and say, I want to try this. How is it going to affect this? If they refuse to do it, ask to speak to another doctor. Okay, it's their professional duty of care. You shouldn't do it yourself blindly. Although sadly, some people just aren't risking it. But that's one thing I want you to be aware of. So don't just follow the, the crazy advice of, you know, an architect online near, nearly his mid, you know, at his late 30s. Okay, so guys, thank you very much. See you next time. Bye for now.